Okay, class. Um, sorry I'm late on pulmonology. Uh, COVID is an excuse. I think pretty crazy. At the hospital, hopefully uh, you guys uh, were able to get the lecture slides and do the quiz okay. If not, uh, I will see you guys in person tomorrow. We can go over uh, this uh, briefly and, and the quiz as well. Um, but I'll get right to it. So I pulmonology, I broke down to just asthma and COPD to keep it simple. Uh, asthma we define as a chronic inflammatory disorder that is characteristic of wheezing, breathlessness, cough, chest tightness, uh, particularly at night or early in the morning. Uh, and during episodes, there's variable airway obstruction, often reversible um, with treatment. Um, and that's typically a SABA or a short acting beta agonist, what we would know as albuterol. So um, these are the guidelines that kind of govern how we treat and uh, diagnose and treat asthma. Uh, Gina. Uh, and symptoms of asthma result from a combination of inflammation and bronchoconstriction. Um, so when we treat asthma, we need to address both of those components. Um, and the diagnosis is pretty simple. Uh, you're going to have airway obstruction that is reversible. So we look at the FEV1, which is the forced expiratory volume over one second. Basically, you tell someone to take a deep breath and you have them shoot out as hard and as fast as possible a breath uh, over one second. Um, and in asthma, it's typically that they can't um, exhale uh, properly. Uh, so you'll measure the FEV1, you'll give them some albuterol, you'll wait several minutes, you'll repeat the FEV1. And if you get a 12% or more uh, increase in FEV1, uh, that's pretty diagnostic for asthma. Uh, of course, uh, when we're dealing with asthma, we need to exclude uh, COPD uh, because there might be some overlap. Uh, and so cough is usually non-productive with asthma, but with COPD, it can be productive. That's why we have uh, chronic bronchitis and exacerbations of such. Um, the FEV1 is reversible with asthma, uh, but it is irreversible with COPD. Um, so uh, you'll, we'll see that when we do the treatment, uh, we don't rely on beta agonists, uh, at least short acting ones with COPD. Uh, and the cough is worse at night and early in the morning with asthma uh, and then COPD, it's pretty much consistent throughout the day. Asthma is often also related to allergies uh, and environmental triggers. Um, that's IgE mediated. So you'll see uh, a lot of patients with asthma complain about those symptoms. Uh, and patients with COPD uh, usually have a common history of smoking or exposure to such. And again, asthma can be reversible, uh, but lung damage with COPD is not. A new type of uh, asthma slash COPD is overlap or ACO, asthma COPD overlap. Uh, so there is no really single definition. Uh, it, it's a condition that features both disease states um, and that's really tough to kind of treat. Uh, but basically uh, you'll just kind of line up the features and uh, if there's three or more features that favor asthma, uh, then you'll treat it as such because that's gonna be the predominant uh, pathophysiology. Of course, if there's three or more features that favor COPD, then we would treat as COPD. Uh, a subset of asthma includes exercise-induced bronchospasm, and we'll see this a lot in kids and in athletes, uh, but basically the uh, exercise will, will induce a, a lot of bron bronchial constriction. Um, and to diagnose this, you know, you'll get the person to ex uh, exert themselves. And then uh, there should be a 15% or more decrease in the force expiratory volume. Um, and it's just kind of what you're looking at here. So asthma, uh, you know, usually in children or young adults, that's uh, when the presentation begins. And COPD, it's typically in adults 40 years or older. Uh, pattern of symptoms, remember asthma is more early morning uh, or in the evening. COPD is throughout the day. Uh, lung function, uh, there is reversibility with short acting beta agonists with asthma. And in COPD, there is not. Um, lung function between symptoms, asthma is normal, COPD is abnormal, and typically COPDers will start to retain CO2. So if you look at an ABG, you'll see that their partial pressure of uh, carbon dioxide uh, is increased as they're retaining all that CO2. Um, there's typically a family history with asthma, and in COPD, there's typically a social history of smoking or, or exposure to such irritants or toxins. 
Uh, and then chest radiograph and asthmatics, it's normal. Um, with COPD, you see uh, typically the barrel chest. They use a lot of accessory muscles to breathe, and so their chest is just kind of big and tight. So spirometry is, is diagnostic, um, and these are some of the terms you might run into. So FEV1, uh, like I said, force expiratory volume. Um, and a normal uh, FEV1 should be greater than 80%. So you uh, inhale as much as you can, which would be the forced, um, uh, forced vital capacity, right? So um, once you've inhaled all that you can, uh, most of it, uh, at least 80% of that, should be exhaled within a second, okay? Um, if you don't exhale all that within a second, you're retaining some of that uh, air in your lungs, then there is uh, a problem in the condition. And then the other one that we see is the FEV1 to FVC ratio. Um, that's just a percentage of lung capacity able to be expelled in one second, as I just kind of discussed. Uh, and again, it's also decreased in obstructive diseases uh, like asthma and COPD. So um, GINA 2019 guidelines um, for the assessment of asthma, we assess symptom control from frequency of day and nighttime symptoms. Uh, how, much, how many times they have to rely on their um, short-acting beta agonists uh, and uh, how it affects their uh, activity um, during the day. And so there's patient questionnaires that they, they, you can provide the patient uh, asthma control test or asthma control questionnaire to kind of assess uh, how their, their condition is. Um, there's also broken down for kids, so 6 to 11 years old. And then... Um, this is how we kind of categorize asthma severity. So obviously mild, um, you would start with step one or two treatment and I'll go in that uh, in a second. And then moderate is a, an automatic step three treatment and then severe is step four or five. So a 23 year old woman has been coughing and wheezing about twice weekly and she wakes up at night about three times per month. So if you just remember, nighttime type of symptoms favor asthma, okay? She's never been given a diagnosis of asthma. It's not been to a physician, she says, in years. She uses her roommate's albuterol, but having recently run out of refill, she is seeking care. So we can assume from that that uh, albuterol gives her relief. Um, so again, um, symptomatology that favors asthma. So her activities are not limited by her symptoms, so it doesn't seem like she has exercise-induced asthma, uh, and it's not so bad that her asthma is uh, limiting her um, physical activity. She did spirometry, uh, which has an FEV1 of 82% of predicted. So according to her guidelines, what's the best classification of her asthma? Um, and remember, normal FEV1 uh, is 80% you know, or greater. Um, and so this chart, you're just going to have to kind of memorize in terms of diagnosis, but um, you will see here nighttime awakening. Um, and if we go back real quick, uh, she wakes up at night about three times per month. So um, you'll see here that three or four times per month puts her in the mild persistent category, okay? Um, also, it doesn't say how many times she's been using her albuterol. Um, so that part we don't know. And she's coughing and wheezing about twice weekly. So it seems like she's in the mild persistent category. Um, and then that, because she's in the mild persistent category, if we were to begin treatment, we would st start at step two. Uh, and yep, yeah, the answer is mild persistence, okay? So again, it's, it's based off the symptomatology and, and referring to that chart. Um, here's how we assess asthma control in adults and children. Uh, this is just a simple questionnaire straight from Gina, uh, and we can kind of assess how well controlled these patients are. Treatment goals, uh, obviously we don't want to have any symptoms if we can help it, no exacerbations if we can help it. We don't want them to be limited on their activities, obviously. Uh, we wanna maintain near normal pulmonary function. We do wanna risk, we do wanna reduce the risk or the use of uh, albuterol or short acting beta agonists, obviously because they are not devoid of side effects. Uh, and we're trying to wanna minimize any adverse events from any medications we prescribe them. What are some risk factors for poor outcomes in treatment? Um, anyone who's uncontrolled uh, with their asthma symptoms, okay? Um, 
And these are some of the medication factors. If we don't give them an inhaled corticosteroid, that's what ICS is. Uh, because if you remember back, two components to asthma, right? There's inflammation, and then there's also airway constriction, and we have to address both components. So if you just address airway constriction by giving them albuterol, but you don't address the um, inflammation, um, then we're, you know, we're already putting them um, into poor outcomes, right? So we have to give them an inhaled corticosteroid. Uh, we obviously have to make sure that their inhaler technique is spot on. So that's something that you want to go over with your patients, um, and also to make sure that they adhere to it. Uh, on one of the the big things about adherence is inhaled corticosteroids, you don't feel it, right? So it's, it's a long-term treatment. It's a maintenance drug. Uh, when you take it, you don't feel like this is working. I don't, you, don't, you don't feel anything immediate. And so patients tend not to take it because they're like, what, what is this thing doing? It's not doing anything. Whereas they rely more on the albuterol because they feel it. It works pretty quickly within you know, several minutes. Um, and then when they're gasping for air and then all of a sudden they take albuterol and then they can, they can breathe again, uh, they, they tend to stick to that. Uh, and then they start to use that more and more uh, and become dependent on it. Okay. So we do have to address adherence um, technique. Uh, and then also, again, try to find out those patients of yours that are relying too much on of albuterol. Okay. And then any comorbid conditions, obesity, which can um, typically lead to uh, OSA. Um, obstructive sleep apnea. If you have GERD, that tends to worsen things, okay? And then anxiety, depression, and then pregnancy. Uh, some other risk factors include environmental exposure. So especially with asthmatics, they get uh, allergies, uh, rhinitis, so we gotta try to avoid them. Um, sniffing pollen, grass, and all that good stuff. Pet dander is always a big one, dust. Um, Anyone who has poor lung function, well, obviously it's gonna uh, predict poor outcomes. And then there's a fractional exhaled nitric oxide, a different type of test, but we won't go over that one. Okay, so again, the components, right? There's two main pharmacologic classes. We have steroids to help with the inflammation long-term, and then we have bronchodilators. And in the bronchodilators, you can, you can classify them as short-acting, SABAs, or long-acting, long-acting beta agonists, which last a bit longer, right? So uh, inhalation drug therapy has three obvious advantages. Um, you can maximize the therapeutic effects, right? Because the delivery of the medication is straight to the lungs, we're inhaling it. We minimize systemic effects, right? We're not um, having to absorb as much of that stuff uh, into the bloodstream uh, like we do with pills or intravenous medications. And then of course it's more rapid and we don't have to wait for um, dissolution and absorption through the gut and metabolism and all that good stuff. Again, it's deposition straight into the lungs. And there's three types of, uh, of uh, inhalers, okay? There's the traditional meter dose inhalers. This is little uh, metal can canisters, right? And then you just kind of shake them and poof, poof, poof. Um, that's traditionally, uh, you see that in albuterol. Uh, there's a special kind of meter dose inhaler called a respimat. It's a different type of technology, but basically um, you twist it and the, the canister creates a mist where they can kind of breathe it in like a, a nebulizer. Um, and so certain manufacturers of certain drugs have respimats. Um, then there's a dry powder inhaler, which is basically uh, uh, capsules contained within an inhaler. You um, prime the inhaler, uh, which then causes it to poke a little hole in the capsule, releasing the powder inside. And then the patient has to be able to suck it in um, in order to like suck in the, the, the powder from the capsule. And that goes down into the lungs. And then the nebulizers, which uh, we know if you've worked in ED or if you've taken your child to pediatrics, uh, you know, they give you a nebulizers. So it's a video on respimats. Uh, I wonder if this is going to play. Oh, there we go. So you can see, and this is steel toe, I believe, is a type of inhaler. So this guy opens it. He primed it. He opens it. He pushes the button. And then you'll see it like this little cloud mist. It's like an instant bong. Uh, but yeah, if you have a patient who has terrible technique, um, or is just you know, not, not, doesn't have very great finger dexterity, uh, this, this respite that might be pretty helpful. Okay. So question two, which medication is best to recommend for our female patient from the beginning? 
uh, in addition to budesonide for motorol, uh, meter dose inhaler every 46 hours is needed. No additional therapy, oral Montelukas, Mometazone, or budesonide for motorol. Now, if you remember back, she is mild intermittent, right? Uh, and so that's class two. And so we won't need any additional therapy. And if we look here, these are the steps. So once you've determined where their diagnosis or classification is, that'll tell you what step to take, right? So um, you'll see here at step one or step two for adults, you look at the adults here. Um, I think I can draw this thing, let me see. Hopefully this doesn't get screwed up. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we gotta pay attention to the adults here, right? 12 and over, uh, just to keep things simple. And then you'll see that the preferred treatment, low dose in Hill plus formoderol as needed. And formoderol is just a long acting beta agonist. And it's uh, pretty much the same uh, with step, step two. So you can do low dose uh, inhaled corticosteroid daily or low dose inhaled corticosteroid, inhaled corticosteroid plus formoderol as needed. Okay. Uh, and then here, step three, you start with that. Step four is here, and step five is uh, right there, self-explanatory. So you'll be referring to this chart a lot to determine uh, where treatment should start. Okay, anti-inflammatory drugs. Basically, we're talking about uh, um, corticosteroids. So this is a foundation of asthma therapy because uh, there is a inflammatory component to it. We wanna make sure that we control that. Uh, the more we control that inflammation, the less exacerbations that patient will have and then the less reliance on albuterol. So we take that daily for long-term control. Um, and steroids, just like oral steroids or intravenous steroids are anti-inflammatories, we know this. Um, and that causes a reduction in infiltration and activity in inflammatory cells, which then causes a lot of um, decrease edema in the airway mucosa. Uh, and like I said, usually by inhalation, it's you know, contained in a lot of these inhalers, but you can do oral and IV if needed. Uh, okay. So again, use prophylaxis, and we have to really explain this to patients. You're not going to really feel anything from this, but trust us. It's reducing the number of exacerbations and the number of times you have to rely on albuterol. So you have to take it all the time, no matter how you're feeling, okay? And because you don't feel anything, don't use it or don't rely on it if you're having an attack, that is when you would uh, use albuterol or you know check into the ED. Um, okay, so yes, if you're severe enough in your classification and you have to rely on inhaled corticosteroid, you know, make sure you're taking that. And of course, in corticosteroids, safer than systemic glucocorticoids. We know that systemic glucocorticoids long-term, um, you know, cause weight gain, edema, buffalo hump, moon faces, um, all that's good. So diabetes, um, osteoporosis, all kinds of nasty things, right? Uh, so here, oral use, usually when there's an as asthma exacerbation, they'll give you a short course. You could do like a medrol dose pack. You could do um, prednisone 40 milligrams. And typically for asthma, it's a short course, five or so days. Um, and we'll do anywhere from 40 to 60 milligrams a day. Most often what I see is a, a tapering. Um, and if you don't remember uh, glucocorticoids, systemic glucocorticoids, um, can cause HPA axis suppression, which is uh, suppressing your normal uh, endogenous release of um, cortisol, uh, which is necessary for your um, stress response. And so we don't want to have that happen. But typically, um, steroid courses less than 14 days, um, 14 to 21 days, tends to not cause HPA suppression. Um, but most doctors play it safe and then they'll just prescribe a short course with a taper. Um, but most of the data shows that you don't really need to taper as long as it's um, a short course, um, less than 14 to 21 days. And uh, the only bad thing is if you start to inhale these steroids, they kind of cause orthopharyngeal candidiasis, which is just, um, candida of the mouth, especially on the tongue, you get that white film. So we have to be, um, um, extra careful with patients and tell them once you use this inhaler, 
if you have to rinse your mouth out with uh, water and spit it out, um, keep your tongue clean. Otherwise, you're going to have uh, oropharyngeal candidiasis. In children, there's been discussions uh, for the longest time about how steroids may inhibit growth. It does slow growth, but it doesn't inhibit it. Uh, by the time the child turns to an adulthood, uh, they tend to be at the height uh, they would have reached uh, if they were not on inhaled corticosteroids. So a slowing of the growth, but not a stunting of it, okay? And again, long-term uh, risks of steroids, like I had mentioned, osteoporosis. Oh, I forgot about glaucoma and cataracts. Uh, but again, typically seen in systemic absorption of steroids, not really so much with uh, inhaled steroids. Uh, okay, so you can just kind of read over that. Oh, I talked about a little bit of adrenal suppression. Again, not seen in um, inhaled steroids, but typically seen in oral steroids. Um, and again, with long-term greater than 14 to 21 days, uh, does that start to cause uh, suppression? And if you do do that uh, suppression, you know, you have to taper down really, really slow uh, because namely recovery of adrenal cortical function can take several months. And so we don't want to leave the person without stress response because uh, that could be deadly. This is a table of all the steroids. Uh, I don't expect you to memorize everything. Just kind of be able to pick out what a steroid sounds like. So they usually end in sone or eyed. So you see beclomethasone, uh, fluticasone, mometasone, and then budesonide, cyclesonide, flunisolide. So those are all steroids. Uh, again, rinse the mouth out, use long-term. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Oh, and um, maintenance therapy, right? Uh, other inflammatory drugs, anti-inflammatory drugs are the leukotriene modifiers, and there's really three in this class, um, but they promote smooth muscle constriction uh, by blocking either the effect of leukotriene by blocking the receptor, or they block the production of leukotrienes. Um, and so that causes, uh, promotes smooth muscle constriction. Oh, uh, well, it'll block all the things that leukotrienes do promote. So leukotrienes promote smooth muscle constriction uh, blood vessel permeability and an inflammatory response by uh, recruiting eosinophil. So you, know, you can guess that in asthma patients that have a high eosinophil account, leukotriene modifiers might be helpful for that. But they are second line agents. Um, they were talking about taking these to market over the counter several, several years ago, uh, but there was a link to neuropsychiatric behavior, including suicidal ideality. And so they stopped, they, um, they, they went away with that plan. So you still have to get this prescribed. Most popular agent here is uh, obviously going to be Montelukast Singular. I'm sure you guys have seen that at some point in your life. Um, there is a monoclonal antibody, which is an antibody to, against uh, immunoglobulin E called omalizumab, uh, Zolaire. Uh, it antagonizes IgE, and it's indicated for patients age 12 or older. It is a subcutaneous injection. Uh, it can cause all these uh, events, but there is a black box warning towards cardiovascular events and it can cause anaphylaxis. So as you can see in this table here, Montelukast uh, is also the one that is used um, in the youngest of patients. So uh, let's see if I can do this. So you can see all the way down to uh, I think that was, yeah, one years old. So uh, they do make a, a, a like granule packet for four, a four milligram granule packet so that young children can take it. Um, so you do have to watch out um, for the neuropsychiatric events. Okay, so just kind of remember that. Um, and also this rare uh, syndrome called Churg Strauss. So Churg Strauss is a type of vasculitis. Um, and you can Google what the vasculitis looks like, um, but you'll, you'll see it manifest in the skin. Um, and so there's a chance that uh, these leukotriene modifiers might, might increase that risk. And then uh, Zolaire omelizumab uh, is a subcutaneous injection. You do that every two to four weeks. So do remember, it may increase the risk for cardiovascular events um, right here, including MI. Um, transient ischemic attack, uh, PEDVT, pulmonary hypertension. Um, so just gotta watch out for that. 
you don't see it much because it is expensive. Uh, and of course, again, it can cause anaphylaxis, which is rare, but uh, can happen. Okay. Clear this now. Where's my mouse? Okay. Okay. There we go. Okay. Bronchodilators. So um, those are the albuterols. Um, Activation beta-2 receptors, which are found in the smooth muscle of the, line, of the lungs. So as we agonize these or activate them, they'll cause bronchodilation, opening up the airways, allowing the person to, to breathe better. Uh, and it is used in both asthma and COPD. Um, and we just typically use it, in, at least in asthma, uh, on an as-needed basis. Um, when you do treat it with for when you do use it, uh, sorry, let me take a step back. If you use a long acting beta agonist in asthma, um, you do have to always combine it with a glucocorticoid. You should never use a long acting beta agonist such as formoterol uh, or salmeterol uh, alone in asthma. There was a, a pretty pivotal study that looked at long acting beta agonists uh, as monotherapy in asthmatics, and there was an increased risk of death in that subset of patients, uh, but they didn't see that uh, in, in, in patients who combine it with steroids. So uh, I don't remember what the reason was, I'd have to look it up again, but for whatever reason, uh, don't do LABAs alone uh, for asthma. In COPD, this doesn't seem to be the case. You can do a long-acting beta agonist monotherapy uh, in COPD uh, without a glucocorticoid or a steroid. Uh, and it doesn't seem to affect morbidity or mortality, but in asthma, yes, you do have to always remember that. Uh, there we go, like I said, leading to hospitalization and death. Uh, so we don't wanna do that. Uh, and in asthma, labas are typically uh, further down the line of treatment. Uh, like I said, we typically wanna do uh, or maximize or optimize uh, inhaled corticosteroids. Uh, so once asthma control is achieved and maintained, uh, you should try to assess if the patient can step down. Uh, obviously, uh, we don't want to um, expose them to too much steroid or to too much use of albuterol. Um, so if they can tolerate it and they can step down, then that would be the preferred uh, treatment or methodology. So this is the SABAS, a short-acting big agonist, again, albuterol being the mainstay. Um, you can use it it's again, short acting. So you have to use it frequently throughout the day uh, because it agonizes beta receptors, uh, beta two receptors, uh, you can cause tremor. Um, the more you use it, remember any type of drug that affects a receptor, the more of it that there is, the less selective it can be towards that receptor. So as we flood our bodies with albuterol, it tends to be less selective for beta two and just starts hitting all the beta receptors, including beta one in the heart. And that is the mechanism why it's causing tachycardia. And weird thing is albuterol can cause a shift of potassium. Um, so you can see a hypokalemia uh, that causes potassium in the blood to shift into the cells. And it's actually one of the treatment um, treatments that we do for anyone who comes in with hyperkalemia. Uh, and uh, in asthmatics, again, if uh, you're relying on this albuterol too much, uh, then that usually would show poor control. There was another agent called level butyrol. It's a, an isomer of albuterol, like a side of it, a half of it. Um, and in, when this was marketed, they said that this, this half of albuterol, level butyrol, um, had the same efficacy as albuterol, but less of the side effects including the tremor, tachycardia, all that stuff. Uh, but that hasn't really panned out in real life. Um, and so you don't really see level butyrol prescribed as much. There's really no advantage to it. These are the long acting beta agonists. So first one's R formoterol, it's Brovana. That's an inhalation. Then there's formoterol, uh, which you see in the guidelines. Um, 
and that's called Performamist. Uh, there's a more, and then there's two more recent ones, Indicaterol, which is Arcapta, uh, and then there's Olodaterol, which is part of Striverti. Um, and so those two are only indicated in COPD, and then there's Salmeterol, which is Cerevent, uh, and again, not used in uh, asthma as monotherapy. And then there are some agents that combine both uh, short-acting beta agonists with a with a short-acting muscarinic antagonist. That's what that SAMA is. So there's albuterol ipratropium, which is commonly called Compavent. Um, and then there's also ipratropium albuterol uh, duoneb uh, inhalation. Uh, just briefly on methyl xanthines, this is an older agent. You're not going to see this too often, but the, the typical drug here is theophylline. Um, there is an IV version called aminophylline, uh, which is usually uh, used in children. Uh, theophylline can cause bronchodilation. Um, it is a narrow therapeutic drug. So if you remember from the first lecture, drugs that have narrow therapeutic index have a short range. Um, so you have a very short window to, um, to get this right. Uh, so the plasma level that you're aiming for is 10 to 20. Uh, anything uh, past that causes all kinds of uh, side effects and toxicity. Um, so theophylline is no longer recommended in the treatment, uh, but in case you see it, it still does exist. Um, and these are the plasma levels. So if you're looking at plasma levels, remember we said 10 to 20 was goal. Um, if you hit 20 to 25, the patient starts to complain about nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, insomnia, and restlessness. And then 30 and above is where you start to run into trouble. That can cause ventricular fibrillation and seizures. Uh, and then eventually death can happen. If a patient is uh, exhibiting toxicity, have them stop it. Um, if they try to overdose themselves, uh, activated charcoal uh, might, might be helpful um, because it causes ventricular arrhythmias. Lidocaine is a ventricular uh, antiarrhythmic, so we would use that. And then intravenous um, benzodiazepines, such as diazepam uh, for seizures. It interacts with these agents, so caffeine, cimetidine, or fluoroquinolone antibiotics. If a patient's taking any of those, uh, it may increase the toxicity or serum levels of, of uh, theophylline. So just kind of keep an eye on those. Ipatropram is a short-acting muscarinic antagonist. Um, this blocks muscarinic receptors. Uh, which then reduces bronchoconstriction. Uh, and it works pretty quickly, 30 seconds. Um, and it can cause, because it's anti-muscarinic, think of acetylcholine, right? Acetylcholine acts on muscarinic and nicotinic receptors. So if we are anti-acetylcholine, we are anti-cholinergic. And so anti-cholinergics cause dry mouth, dry eyes, urinary hesitancy, constipation, uh, drowsiness, those kinds of things. Um, again, we're limiting systemic side effects, right? So um, you probably will just see dry mouth more than you see all these other systemic side effects uh, from systemic anticholinergics. Teotropium is a long-acting muscarinic antagonist, right? So LAMA. Um, so it's just like ipratropium, but instead of ipratropium, which you have to do like four times a day, teotropium is once a day. Uh, it is approved for COPD, not for asthma, okay? Um, but same, same kind of mechanism, just longer acting. Acladinium, again, is a, another type of long acting, uh, anti-muscarinic, uh, but nothing special about this drug. Just putting it up there for your reference. Uh, so here we go, short acting muscarinic antagonist. Think of anticholinergic symptoms, okay? And then these are all the long acting ones. So we have acladinium, which is Tadorza, uh, glycopyrrolate, which is also available as an IV, uh, but they put it also in an inhaler, um, rebifenacin, teotropium, and umacladinium. Um, to make life easier for the patient, they've combined these with uh, glucocorticoids with long-acting big agonists, also with long-acting muscarinic antagonists. So you'll see a lot of combination products out there to just kind of make life easier for patients. Um, certainly don't prescribe these unless they do qualify for both agents. Okay. So just kind of watch out for that. So here's all the combos. Um, budesonide from Motorol, right? So budesonide is a corticosteroid from Motorol is a long acting beta agonist. So that's Simbacort. Uh, there's also Advair, which you may have seen. There's Breo and then there's uh, Dulera. 
There's one that combines an inhaled corticosteroid with a long-acting muscarinic antagonist along with a long-acting beta agonist. Uh, so it's triple therapy. We call it Trilogy Ellipta. Get it? Um, usually not covered by insurances. Uh, it's about, I think, 500 bucks a inhaler. That's, a, I think, a dry powder inhaler. Yeah, dry powder inhaler. So you don't see this very often. And then there's combination long-acting beta agonists with long-acting muscarinic antagonists. These are typically just for COPD um, as anti-muscarinics work better in COPD. Um, and we'll go over that soon. So again, uh, along with addressing the two components of asthma, inflammation and airway constriction, do uh, ask the patient's home, uh, make sure that they're not exposed to allergens. So I just like to ask about pets, uh, do you have a lot of house dust? Um, if so, um, you know, switch to furniture and, and rearrange your house so that you minimize dust. Um, get a vacuum that's really good at dust. Get a vacuum that's really good at, at picking up pets, uh, pet dander. Uh, you know, one of um, maybe like a HEPA filter if they can see that. Do they have any bugs? Uh, cockroaches can leave all kinds of, of mess that can be irritating. And then also mold. Um, and so uh, I, I would you know, really do a, a thorough house review to make sure that all these sources of allergens are out of there. Um, in their pillows, you know, do they use feather in their pillows or is it a hypoallergenic uh, pillow and blanket? Because um, that, that could be a, also a source of irritant for them. And then is there any tobacco smoke, wood smoke? Hell, it's Bakersfield, so there's smoke all over the place, but um, household sprays, anything that you can minimize uh, that they may not have thought about uh, would be worthwhile asking. Okay, so acute exacerbation, I'm just gonna quickly go over this, but you know, uh, every once in a while, uh, an asthmatic uh, patient's gonna have uh, an exacerbation that may warrant an uh, urgent care or emergency department visit. And obviously, uh, once they get there, they're gonna give them oxygen. And they're gonna give them a systemic glucocorticoid, which is typically a methylprednisolone IV. They'll nebulize a high dose of albuterol. It's typically 10 milligrams of albuterol. They'll just continuously nebulize it, so they'll just have the mask on. Uh, and that's to help them get out of the exacerbation. Now for exercise induced asthma, um, typically they'll have a beta agonist and it can be a short acting beta agonist typically. Uh, there is one long acting beta agonist that is approved for exercise induced asthma, uh, but you usually give this to them about 10 to 15 minutes before uh, they, they exercise so that it can kind of get in their system uh, and then prevent the airway constriction. Oh, see, I talked about this. All right, so pillows, mattresses, box springs, um, remove carpeting, go with, you know, bare um, tile, wood, uh, anything like that, uh, and keep indoor humidity below 50%. Uh, there are newer agents. This one's an interleukin-4 antagonist. So interleukin-4, like many interleukins, one, six, four, uh, are all inflammatory markers. So dupulumab, uh, brand name is dupixent. Uh, is a interleukin-4 antagonist, uh, which is great for asthmatics who have eosinophilia. Um, I don't know if they define eosinophilia, but typically if you do a CBC with a differential, uh, eosinophilia is typically 800 uh, cells per microliter, I think. Uh, so if they have a high eosinophilic account, uh, dupilumab might be an option for them. Uh, there's also interleukin-5 antagonists. Again, same, same kind of idea, and inhibit interleukins, uh, which are inflammatory markers. Uh, there's three here, mepolizumab, reslizumab, and benralizumab. Um, and again, these are for asthmatic patients who have an eosinophilic phenotype. So yeah, an eosinophilic uh, asthma. Okay, so moving on to COPD. Um, now remember, COPD is a common treatable syndrome uh, of obstructive uh, or obstructive airway disease, right? Um, and airflow obstruction may be accompanied by airway hyper-responsiveness and may be fully reversible. Um, so it's typically done into two components right here, okay? So chronic bronchitis consists of a, a COPD patient that always exhibits a persistent cough plus sputum production. Remember that asthma is, is a dry cough. In here, it's sputum production for most days of three months and at least two consecutive years. 
Um, and it may be an independent disease entity that may occur before or after the development of airflow limitation. Mm -hmm. And in emphysema, uh, there's an abnormal permanent enlargement of the air spaces distal to the terminal bronchioles, um, accompanied by destruction of their walls and without obvious fibrosis. Uh, emphysema is only one of several structural abnormalities in patients with COPD. Um, so the clinical diagnosis of COPD is based on history of exposure to risk factors, quote unquote, cigarette smoking, and the presence of airflow limitation that is not fully reversible with the presence of symptoms. So patients will have dyspnea, uh, poor exercise tolerance, chronic cough, speed and production, and wheezing. So like there is GINA for asthma, there is GOLD for COPD, uh, and we'll wanna perform spirometry. Um, and if the patient especially is complaining of dyspnea that is progressive and persistent and worsens with exercise or exertion. So uh, contrast that with asthma again. So asthma may have dyspnea, but it's not typically progressive and it's typically not persistent, right? They could have uh, severe asthma and that could cause some persistence, but compared to COPD, um, again, it's typically just worse during the morning and night, whereas in COPD, it's present throughout the entire day. And then COPD ears have a chronic cough, um, you know, that may present intermittently or every day. Uh, COPD ears may have chronic sputum production in any pattern, which may, you know, put them in the chronic bronchitis class. Uh, and then um, history of exposure to risk factors, tobacco smoke, um, occupational dust, chemicals, that kind of thing. Um, so a single best predictor of airflow obstruction is the presence of all three of the following. A patient who has a smoking history of 55 pack years, uh, if there's any wheezing on auscultation, and then a patient self-report of wheezing. So a spirometry reading revealing an FEV1 over FEC less than 70% of predicted is the hallmark test for COPD. Uh, we don't rely on bronchodilator reversibility testing anymore. Um, but again, if you do have uh, improvement in an FEV1 of greater than 12%, that's typically asthma. Uh, but for COPD, you'll want to do, uh, you'll do history, you'll do symptoms, you'll do FEV over FEC. Um, and if it's really severe, you might consider pulling an ABG. So on the basis of the spirometry result, uh, you assign them a, a grade uh, using the gold criteria. Uh, and the gold grade is primarily used to direct non-pharmacologic interventions uh, such as pulmonary rehab uh, or lung reduction surgery. So if you're mild FEV, uh, you know, you're gold one, uh, moderate FEV, 50 to 79% is gold two, so on and so forth. CAT is a uh, questionnaire. That's a CPD assessment test. Um, and you give this to patients. It's uh, several questions. They answer them. And then you tally up the score and you can kind of uh, categorize how uh, good or bad their COPD is. So CAT's nice, it's easy to understand. You can Google it, you can find it online, it's free. Uh, it measures not just breathlessness of the patient, but also their cough, speed and production. And then if there has any limitations on their activities. Um, so five is the upper limit of normal, less than 10 is a low impact on life. And then more than 30 is a high impact on life, which means that they can barely leave the house before becoming dyspneic. There's another questionnaire uh, called the MMRC. This is the Modified um, Research Council. And I forgot what the other M stood for, but you can Google that. Uh, but same idea as CAT is to just question the patient and, and then try to give them a predict how well they're doing. So zero is, you know, least number of symptoms, uh, whereas four is too breathless to leave the house. Uh, so measuring CPD, we need spirometry to measure lung function, right? And then we're gonna classify their severity, mild, moderate, severe, or very severe. Uh, again, treatment goals are pretty much like asthma goals. We just kind of want to reduce uh, everything. Um, and then you're just gonna classify them. So, um, you can classify them based on their FEV status, and then you can also classify them on their risk uh, and their symptoms. Um, and then the treatment is very similar to asthma. So short-acting beta agonists are typically not 
useful here. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, but we're going to do uh, in systemic local corticoids if it worsens. Antibiotics you can consider, especially if it's an exacerbation of uh, chronic bronchitis. And then um, if they do O2 sats and they've dropped to below 92%, uh, supplemental oxygen may be useful. So once you figure out uh, what group to put them in, and this is based off this group. Okay, so if, if you have a patient, let's say like group C, few symptoms but high risk. Uh, you would start them here, uh, long-acting muscarinic antagonists for initial monotherapy, okay? So classify them first and then figure out what treatment course to start with. So group A, shorter long-acting bronchodilator. Group B, long-acting bronchodilator. There's no preference between the long-acting beta agonist or a long-acting muscarinic antagonist. Group C is long-acting muscarinic antagonist. And then group D, uh, you're probably going to give them a LAMA. Um, and if they have severe symptoms based on their score, you might throw on a LABA, and if they have elevated eosinophils, you might uh, put in a hill corticosteroid. Okay, I said 800 earlier with uh, elevated eosinophils. This one says uh, 300. Okay, so there's that. Uh, so treatment with a LAMA delays first exacerbation, reduces the overall number of COPD exacerbations related to hospitalizations, improves symptoms and health status, and improves the effectiveness of pulmonary rehab. Uh, unfortunately, LAMAs have no effect on the rate of decline of lung function, uh, but studies with teotropium show there's no increase in cardiovascular risk, uh, and they do um, help with the symptoms, uh, but they may not improve FEV1 because, again, the, the lung function uh, is progressive lung function decline is, prog is progressive. Uh, Long-acting beta agonists, uh, we're talking like salmeterol, formoterol, indicatorol, olodaterol. Um, those in do improve health status, quality of life, FEV1, and decrease the COPD exacerbation rate. Uh, but just like LAMAs, there is no mortality benefit or any um, decrease in the rate of decline of the lung function. So all this is just symptom, symptom relief. Um, but again, if you can prevent them from uh, going to the hospital, you've saved some healthcare dollars. So salmeterol does reduce hospitalization rate. Um, Indicatorol helps uh, improve breathlessness and exacerbation rate. Um, and ind indicatorol is a, a long-acting beta agonist with significantly greater bronchodilator effect than salmeterol. Um, and it has a similar effect to teotropium, which is that long-acting muscarinic antagonist. Okay. And again, uh, long-acting beta agonist monotherapy in COPD is not a concern, but it is a concern in asthma. Okay, so a 62-year-old man was recently given a diagnosis of COPD. Spironchi revealed an FEV1 uh, over FEC of 60% of predicted, and a pre-bronchodilator FEV1 70% of predicted, and a post-bronchodilator FEV1 72% of predicted. So uh, already... FEV1, FEC is less than 70, right? So that's diagnostic typically of COPD. Uh, but just to do a bronchodilator challenge, we did uh, a baseline FEV1, which was 70% predicted. If this was asthma, we would have we would have seen a 12% or greater increase in FEV1, but here uh, it was only 2%, right? He went from 70 to 72. So pretty much this is COPD. Um, symptoms are quite bothersome. He reports walking more slowly than others because of shortness of breath having to catch his breath so often. Uh, his MMRC score is two, four being worse, right? So he's kind of in the middle. He had one exacerbation in the past year that thankfully didn't require hospitalization. But in addition to albuterol, two plus or four, six hours is needed. This is just to get him to his exacerbation. What's the most appropriate um, therapy to initiate? So we have no therapy, we have salmeterol, we have teotropium olodaterol, and then we have salmeterol fluticasone plus reflumolast. The answer here would be, oh, I guess we'll go over this first. Okay, so um, if we look at the patient group here, let me get my little pen here. Okay. So uh, if we look back, he, he had, he had um, one exacerbation in the past year, right? Okay. Uh, 
so oh, I just think it's acting crazy. Okay. Uh, okay, so well, less one exacerbation in the past year, uh, and no hospitalization. Um, and he didn't seem to have many symptoms. It says here CAT score, but let's see, we don't have an MMRC. Um, so it's either A or B. Uh, and you can see her recommended first choice is a bron bronchodilator, short or long acting, or a lab or a llama. Um, so let's see actually what I put down here because I'm not sure. Oh, you know what? Let me clear this up first. Okay, so Sanra. So it looks like he was a patient group B, right? So he. Because of his MMRC score, he had many symptoms. Uh, I guess we, we read that through the question. But he had no hospitalizations, less one exacerbation in the year. So the recommended first choice is either a long-acting beta agonist or a long-acting muscarinic antagonist. And so salmeterol is the long-acting beta agonist in this case. Uh, so that's the answer. Uh, Teotropium allodaterol is a LAMA plus LABA. Um, and so that's not necessary for a, a group B. And then salmeterol fluticasone is a LABA plus inhaled corticosteroid plus reflumolase, which we'll, we'll go over uh, in a second. Okay, so reflumolase is a phosphodiesterase type four inhibitor, which that's what PDE is. Um, and it can be used as a daily treatment for COPD exacerbations if you have severe COPD. So your FEV1 should be less than 50%. This guy's was uh, 60, right? Um, and associated with chronic bronchitis and a history of frequent exacerbations despite treatment with triple therapy, uh, particularly if your eosinophil count is less than 100. So it's a pretty strict, tight criteria, right? Uh, so you have to have COPD exacerbations, severe COPD, um, history of chronic bronchitis with frequent exacerbations, and you have to be on triple therapy. So if you've met all that and you're still having, you know, wheezing and progressive dyspnea and all that good stuff, uh, you could qualify for Um Let's see here, these patient reduction. So there's a reduction in exacerbations uh, when using reflumolast. Uh, no trials have assessed the effects of reflumolast on stupid exacerbation added to this combination of drugs, um, yeah, but it is being studied. So reflumolast reduces inflammation through inhibition of uh, the breakdown of intracellular cyclic adenosine monophosphate. There is no direct bronchodilator activity. It's nice to titrate the dose. You start 250 once daily for four weeks to increase it. And that's just because of better GI tolerance. Uh, but the gold dose is 500 mics once daily. Um, and then it's PD uh, for flumolase is contraindicated in moderate to severe liver impairment. It can cause weight loss. It's not super significant. The average weight loss was two kilograms, uh, but it is something to be kind of aware of. And then there was also some suicidal uh, ideation with the medication. Uh, but more of the common side effects included nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, uh, insomnia. Uh, used with strong cytochrome cytochrome P450 enzyme inducers, right? So rifampin, phenobarbital is not recommended. Use with CYP3 or 4 inhibitors, and this you should have memorized, uh, can also cause uh, an increase in reflumless exposure and adverse events. And I'm gonna stop right here for a little bit. I will be back. Just, sorry about that. Okay, sorry about that. Um, as I left off, I apologize. Uh, so any uh, CYP3 for enzyme inducers or inhibitors will um, interact with reflumolase. So just kind of be cautious about that. Um, and according to ACCP CTS guidelines, to prevent exacerbations for reflumolase is suggested for patients with moderate to severe COPD with chronic bronchitis and a history of at least one exacerbation in the past year. Vaccinations, um, just briefly, influenza vaccine should be annual essentially for all patients. And if you have um, you know, asthma before age 65, you should get the Pneumovax vaccine. Then in accordance with CDC recommendations, um, if you're age 65 or older, um, you can get pneumococcal vaccination as well. Um, 
I'm sorry, this is a little bit confusing because I think this stuff changes all the time um, because there's two different types of uh, pneumo, uh, pneumonia vaccine. The older PPSV23, which is pneumovax, and then the newer uh, conjugate vaccine, which is um, Provenar. Um, but I do believe that pneumovax first is recommended and then um, with Prevnar afterwards. So it, you can see the third bullet point, Prevnar once you've hit age 50 and at least a year after uh, PPSV23. Azithromycin, if you remember, macrolide with some 3 or 4 inhibition. Um, but they did a study to take azithromycin daily at 250 milligram, um, and it was found to lengthen time to first exacerbation and decrease overall exacerbation rate and improve quality of life. Uh, Lancet did also find something um, as well with 500 milligrams three times per week. Um, but there was a potential for hearing loss, uh, pneumonia, GI disturbances, and QTC prolongation. Um, and it can be recommended as add-on treatment intensification uh, once patients have hit, uh, you know, kind of uh, severe COPD. Uh, I don't really see this too often um, being prescribed. Um, and then I also have, you know, some concerns for uh, bacterial resistance plus the C. diff with long-term antibiotic use. Uh, but uh, because COPD patients will have exacerbations of, acute, of their chronic bronchitis at some point, antibiotics, uh, you know, will be a mainstay. And again, uh, the most common pathogens in COPD are those that are just uh, similar to pneumonia. Um, which is streptococcus pneumonia, haemophilus, and moraxella. Uh, if you're a patient with gold three or four status, pseudomonas uh, also becomes an important pathogen. Uh, the three cardinal symptoms in COPD exacerbations are increased dyspnea, uh, an increase in sputum volume, and an increase in sputum purulence. Um, and so if you do present with all three cardinal symptoms, uh, antibiotics should be prescribed. Uh, typical duration will be five to seven days, and the recommended antibiotics include empiric treatment using uh, augmentin, so amoxicillin with clavulanic acid, uh, azithromycin, or, or tetracycline, like doxycycline. Um, if you've used antibiotics within the last 90 days, uh, you might want to try an, an alternative class just to prevent um, bacterial resistance. Um, in complicated COPD with risk factors, stronger antibiotics are typically warranted. Uh, that includes high dose augmentin or some of the fluoroquinolones. Uh, so if you remember your respiratory fluoroquinolones, those include levofloxacin and moxifloxacin. Um, if you are at risk for a pseudomonas, then levoquin uh, is your kind of drug of choice, uh, as well as ciprofloxacin. Those are the two fluoroquinolones that do kill pseudomonas. Uh, moxifloxacin does not. Um, and then if uh, the initial antibiotic regimen doesn't uh, take care of the infection, you should uh, attempt to sputum culture and, and sensitivity. Home oxygen, uh, Medicare does pay for home oxygen, but you do have to meet the criteria of a partial pressure of oxygen of 55 millimeter of mercury or less um, and a uh, oxygen saturation of 88% or less. Uh, confirmed twice during a three-week period. But if you do meet that criteria, you can get home oxygen therapy paid for. Uh, and oxygen can be useful for COPD, COPD uh, folks uh, because it does improve survival um, in those patients. If uh, you do run into any patients with home oxygen, just make sure that they're not smoking still. Um, and there is a fire risk, especially because some of that tobacco smoke um, can be caught in the fibers of their clothing. And if they're on high flow oxygen, uh, that could be a recipe for disaster. And that's the end. Uh, so again, I apologize for the lateness of this uh, uh, lecture, but I hope to see you guys soon. Uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a great night. Take care.